Okay. Um, imagine a typical work environment of a new software developer. During application phase, you get promised the stars. We are the best company. We have the best application. We have the best programmers here in our company. And then you sign the contract, you start working as a new developer, and then it's the first working day, and it's about setting up your new machine. And the best which you will probably see is, um, it's not the optimal case, but probably still the best case, that you will be offered a disk image where everything is prepared. So you can kind of copy or clone this disk image, and then your machine is more or less working within one day. The worst case that can happen is um, that you need to ask your coworkers for help. So your coworkers need to come to your machine and help you for a few hours, for a few days in order to set up your machine. And the typical case is that theoretically there are some wiki pages on this company that describe how the machines are to be set up, but they are either outdated or incomplete. I've never seen such wiki pages that are up to date and complete. Okay, that was the first day. Now we are in the first working month and this new software developer tries to gain an initial understanding of the architecture. And slowly this person realizes that there are no API or source code comments. Um, in case if there is any documentation, it is either outdated or it is missing completely. And then he finally has the courage after one month to ask his coworkers, and he says, um, what about documentation? And the nicest answer he will probably get is, we don't do that here. And the worst answer he will get is kind of, so. So from this day on, the following months and year, this new software developer, or no longer new software developer, will spend his working days doing reverse engineering most of his time. I guess you're all familiar with this situation. So then what are the typical excuses? Excuse number one, we are agile. That's why we do not document. Well, I hope you're all proficient enough. Agile does not mean not doing or not having to do any documentation. This is just plain wrong. Then if the economy is going up, the company has no time to do documentation. If the um, business is going down, it currently has no money to do documentation. In other words, they never have, they never want to do or can do documentation. Um, for me, the math is pretty simple. If you just look at the previous slide and take into account how much time and money it costs doing reverse engineering most of the day. And then another typical excuse is we do clean code or test-driven development or extreme programming or put your, uh, put your procedure in here. So the source code is the documentation. Nope. Just, it's even too silly to discuss this topic. I've never seen that this is really the case. So if you want to read about many undeniable reasons for documentations, you can you can take a picture later. Um, you can read these two articles I wrote during the last years, and there's a whole list plus some technical stuff. So that was the introduction. First of all, welcome. I'm so happy that so many of you are here. Um, you will find the slides in the late evening under this short link. I always publish my slides after the talk in case I find any spelling mistake or so. And I will also show you this link at the end of the presentation again. So then you can take another picture at the end of the presentation where I will also show you this link again. I assume to the target audience that you are either a professional Python developer or you're working on non-small projects if you have your little Raspberry Pi hobby project, documentation probably really isn't necessary, but for everything that goes beyond trivial Python projects, I would assume that documentation is important to you. That was about you, now about me. Thank you for the introduction, Slobodan. I'm from Switzerland. I studied computational science and engineering in Zurich. 
Um, I'm certified in Java, Python, and Spring. Actually, my original language is Java. Three years ago, I attained a CAS in machine learning, so that's on top of the studies, and I've been developing software on and off for more than 20 years. Then my second track in my career is teaching, so I got two teaching diplomas, one in computer science and one in mathematics. I've been doing teaching classes and courses for more than 12 years in Java, Python programming, mathematics and algorithms. And with my company, Simplexa Code, I've, besides these two things, I've been working on technical writing, which means I offer documenting software as a service for companies who don't do this. Parentheses, there are many companies who don't do this. And I write a lot of articles for IT journals, mostly in German, but you could find all of them on my website. Good. Half a year ago, I asked these guys from Swiss Dev Jobs, that's a, a job platform on LinkedIn, if they could um, publish a little survey for me, and they were so nice and they did it, so they have, meanwhile, they have 20,000 followers, and this is the most representative thing I currently have. There are 300 votes close, and nearly, and the question was, what is the state of the software documentation at your workplace? And we see that only 22% claim that they are doing pretty well, and all the others don't even know what this is, or um, claim that the code is documentation enough or that their wiki is outdated. So nearly um, three quarters of the people or the company have the problems that the documentation is not in the state that it should be. You need to be aware that every day you do not document, you increase the software debts every single day. And if the debt does not show up with you personally as a developer, it will probably show up um, for your employees who need to read or you need to work with your code, perhaps today, perhaps a few years later, but someone else will suffer if you do not suffer on your own. This goes on until one day you reach a point where reverse engineering takes up most of the time, and then you probably know this, this situation. And just be aware, documentation debts are also technical debts. I don't know if you're aware of the word technical debts. It's very, um, we use it a lot in German, technische Schulden. I don't know if you are aware of this term in, in English or here, even in Italy. Okay. Now, documentation is not documentation. You need to ask yourself actually two questions. The first question is who do you want to address, which is called the audience. There need to be different documentations for external developers. So you, if you publish a library and someone else works with your library or with your API, these are external developers or end users, product managers, product owners are another audience, internal developers again are another audience. So each of these people need different documentation. There are different kinds of documentation. And the second coordinate is what level of detail do you want to document? You can start with, or if you want to document the overall software architecture that's usually done in external documents and using a lot of diagrams, um, if you want to document classes, interfaces, APIs, um, you, you, you do this using doc strings, for example, in Python or Java doc in, in Java. And if you want to document function internals, you usually do this with source code comments. Then you only read them when you read the source, when you read the source code. Now I give you now three things which are very important if you want to be successful in documentation. First, so please forget word or confluence, don't think, I don't know if you've the, um, made the experience that kind of documentation is written in word files, this just doesn't work, it's just not good. I don't want to use strong words here, it's just not good. Don't document using word or LibreOffice or don't document directly in confluence, it's just, um, it's a one-way street. You should use a lightweight markup language. 
you probably know what a markup language is. It's a machine and human readable language for structuring and formatting text and other data. That's what Wikipedia says. You all know HTML plus CSS. You probably know LaTeX. These are markup languages. But the problem is they're kind of clumsy to write them by hand all the time. That's what lightweight la markup languages were invented for. They have a simpler syntax without disturbing the writing and reading flow. You probably know Markdown, have heard of it. We are talking about restructured text today. ASCII doc, well, not talking about a little bit about ASCII doc, and there are various wiki markups. So if anyone edits pages on Wikipedia or on their internal wiki, you use a wiki markup language. These are lightweight markup languages. And here, some years ago, I made this little unscientific diagram on my own, and I claim the more flexible a lightweight or the more flexible a markup language is, the more complex it is also. So LaTeX, you can do everything, including the tip of the eye you can control, but it's kind of, yes, I've spent too many years with LaTeX. I'm an expert in it, but um, I can understand everyone who doesn't want to use LaTeX anymore. And on the other uh, side, you have the Markdown, which is very inflexible. It has a very limited functionality. But on the other hand, it's very easy to use. So kind of the middle, I would claim, is ASCII doc or restructured text. OK. Now, the second thing, docs as code. Who has heard of docs as code? Just a term. Not too many. OK, docs as code simply means that documentation is treated the same way as source code, which means you can write your documentation using the same IDE you use for your programming. It means you check in the documentation using the same version control system that you use for source code. It's just parallel to source code. It's actually the same repository. It's just a folder in there. You use the same process integration. For example, if you have pull requests or, or code reviews and so on, this also means that documentation also goes into this process. And you use the same CI, CD pipeline which means documentation is also processed with your GitLab or Jenkins and so on, and then the files are exported and so on. So it's also the same pipeline. It's important that documentation needs to be in text format. It only works if it's in text format because you want to make diffs and so on and to check in. It does not work with binary format, so that's the reason why you cannot check in and should not check in Word files. It simply doesn't make sense. You want raw text. But with, mark, with, markup, language, was I, with markup languages, what I showed you the slide before, um, it perfectly works like it works with source code because markup languages actually are source code. OK. So, um, and the third thing is probably you know the problem. Let me switch the side now. Good for the camera? So, here, yeah, there's another half of the audience. Um, perhaps you know the problem that you have some documents and you find out that the documentation actually is outdated. And one reason for this is that the documentation is too far away from the source code. So when you take care that the documentation is close to the source code, this probably won't happen, because if you change something in the source code, you will see, oh, there's some documentation. So when you use, when you know Java doc, for example, you have a method, and on top of the method, you have your Java doc API, and it's very hard to not see that there is some documentation regarding this method. So here we have the Java doc. In Python, it's doc strings. I will tell you in a second. C sharp.net, you have another thing. JavaScript, you have another thing. So the big advantage is the close proximity between source code and documentation. That's very important and fundamental. Good. This was the general part. Is the microphone doing fine, actually? Perfect, because I sometimes think that it's uh, 
getting louder and so on. Okay, now we are coming to Python directly. Python uses doc strings for documentation. First of all, who knows Java doc? Who knows Java and Java doc? Okay, a few. Um, Python uses doc strings. Doc strings appear at the beginning of a class or function body. You will just see a screenshot in a second. And it's similar to Java docs, but Java doc you write on top of a method or on top of a class. And in Python you do it below the class or the method. It looks like this in Python. We have a class. Then the first thing you do is you write the doc string. You have a function. The first thing you do, you write the doc string. Doc strings start, start with three double, um, double quotes. And doc strings can be accessed at runtime. So actually, they are not comments like in Java doc. They are actually strings. And these strings can be read out during runtime. So for example, this main function here, if I simply call my function dot underscore underscore doc underscore underscore, it will show me this one here. So this is part of the function. I can read it during runtime. And doc strings could and should contain restructured text syntax. What this is, you will see in a second. Um, there are several tutorials for restructured text and to make it short for you, the best one for Python purposes is this one here. And I will just show you how it looks. I will just show you how it looks like. This is the restructured text lightweight markup language. I will just scroll through it. Here you can make the things italic, bold, code notation, and so on. Lists, numbered list, unordered list, etc., including source code, writing hyperlinks, writing section titles, and so on. You can all find on the website I just showed you. So this is the best starting tutorial I can suggest to you. Now, when it's about generating Python documentation, perhaps, actually every Python book mentions this, there's kind of a help command. Have you ever heard or used the help command? It's, you can type help in the function name, but I don't know if anyone uses this. So this is just command line, and um, I would not read documentation using the help command. Then when you read Python books, they sometimes mention the pydoc command, but I also do not suggest using the pydoc command. It produces very old-fashioned HTML pages, so also no. And the standard way of creating Python documentation is using the Sphinx documentation generator. Now things per se interprets restructured text documents. So you can use things as a standalone solution. You can write your documents of any kind, like your baking recipes or your to-do lists or the essay or the report for your company. Everything which is Python independent, you can do in using things. If you want to connect it to Python, which means if you want to use it for um, documenting the API, you need an extension, which is called um, things API doc. And then if you write your doc strings in one of these three conventions, it is able to interpret it and display a nice API documentation. So by default, you could use the PEP287 restructured text doc string format, but it's written in gray, so don't use this because this is quite an old-fashioned way of writing what parameters are, what arguments are, what exceptions will be thrown, etc. Don't use this. There are two more advanced formats. One of them is the NumPy doc string format. And my personal suggestion that Google doc strings format, which you will see here, and which I will show you now. You need to you need 
um, another extension, but it's just a detail. Um, to tell you. It's called Napoleon, then it will be able to interpret NumPy and Google. And so now that you can imagine what the Google doc string format is about, um, I will just show you here. So that's the section 3.8, and they tell you, is it large enough? They tell you how doc strings should look like. Um, so far, it's nothing special. But now, when it comes to functions, here you see an example with the section args. You describe the, the arguments and returns. You described what is returned. All of this is restructured text syntax. And with races, you describe what kind of error will be thrown in this function or method. Actually, that's all there is about. And you are pretty free to style the um, messages the way you like. So if you are familiar with Java Doc, it kind of all looks the same. It's kind of black and white Java Doc. It's kind of boring. But when you look at the Sphinx documentation from Python modules, they are much more colorful and more, um, how do you say, not so monotonic. They are look, actually, they look much nicer. OK, I just showed you this one here. And now I want to demonstrate um, how this works. Yes, we are good on time. So when you have the slides, you have all the steps I'm showing you here. I do not demonstrate all the steps, but when you have the slides, you have everything written down. I will just show you um, after I did the pip install. So with the pip install, I, um, I, I installed the Sphinx packages. And here I have a little program, which is about a bank account. It has two um, exceptions and just a bank account with deposit and withdraw and so on, and just to demonstrate the use of how documenting works. Now, it's pretty simple. I create a new directory, make their docs, and I go in there. And the best thing to start is when you start the program called Sphinx Quick Start, which is installed when you did all the pip install stuff. And then it asks you separate source and build directories. Then we choose yes. Then let's make a project name. PyCon Italia. Author name. Let's type in my name here, which is difficult with one hand. So. And project release, this is usually my style of writing versions, 2024.05. 20, Language English is fine. So now we see we got a docs directory with build and source. Source means that's everything the documentation generator needs to know. And I hope that this works. Demo. No. Oh, no, I forgot one. So now if I want to create the documentation, I simply type in make HTML. And then it creates all this HTML stuff in the build directory. And then I open it in the browser. And this is what the starting page looks like. Now, usually you do all the setup in the conf and in the index.rst files. I have prepared this already. I have prepared this already to save some time. So I did some configuration here. And I added the Napoleon and the Autodoc extension. And I changed the theme so that it looks a little bit nicer than the default theme. And so on. And now I simply need to call the Sphinx Autodoc, which I told you about.
it should be there, but isn't it there? Things, API doc, not auto doc, API doc, dash O, source, and then the path to the module, which is Sphinx API doc, that's the path to the module where the bank account module is in there. So I hope that this works now. Now it has created some restructured text which describe the module and now I simply do the make HTML again. Build succeeded. Good. Refresh, now we have a now different theme. And I added some text here, some demo text um, with lists and how you can include mathematical formulas, how you can include source code, even how you can create diagrams by textual representation. This is pretty cool. Just have a look at the source code. Actually, it's the diagram is actually here. So this is the source code, block diag to get this one. And this one here is the source code to generate this UML diagram. So this is pretty cool. This is called diagrams as code. And this one is the module I talked about, and here we have the class bank account, and now you see that it's perfectly and neatly um, described. Okay, when you have the slides, I have to hurry up a little bit. Um, here I collected the links for you. You have a gallery of all the different themes you can use. You have a list of projects that use things, so you can get an overview what kind of large projects can be documented using Sphinx, so it is really a cool thing. Some specific examples of classes. Here I just show you one thing, which is the NumPy ND array, because it looks quite cool. So this is a Sphinx documentation of the class NumPy ND array. Probably you know it. Um, it can include formulas. It has some nice admonitions, some nice boxes, and so on. A nice overview. And I also gave you the link to the source code. So this one is the restructured text. Now here you need to code. This one is the restructured text syntax in order to achieve the page which I just showed you one second ago. So you see, even if you do not compile it or generate it, you can still read it and think, yes, I can, I can understand and edit without even generating it. Okay. Now, my personal favorite is ASCII doc, but this is a Python conference, so ASCII doc I need to speed up a little bit. Um, when you read the article, which I will show you at the end, I explain how I, about three years ago, two years ago, I compared all the lightweight markup languages and tried to find the best one. And um, I kicked out everything which has an application focus, like WhatsApp and Slack and so on. And I kicked out everything which is outdated or not longer maintained. And then, it resulted in this top four here, Textile, Media, Wiki, Restructured Text, and ASCII doc. And perhaps you're missing one language. Markdown. So Markdown gets a special slide. Special, special slide. It's by far the most popular lightweight markup language, but it has no standard. It's not standardized. Thus, it has many flavors or dialects. You need to install plugins or HTML code in order to achieve some even some basic things. And it doesn't support tables, cross-references, footnotes, including YouTube videos, and so on. So my suggestion to you, just don't use Markdown. Everything you can do with Markdown, you can also do with ASCII doc, with restructured text, plus many things more. Now, since ASCII doc is such a cool language, I asked myself, is it possible to use ASCII doc for Python doc strings? 
And the problem is I'm not aware that there is any good Sphinx plug-in or converter or whatever that could interpret doc strings in ASCII doc syntax. I don't know if it even makes sense because um, I strongly claim that you one should stick to standards. And the standard for documenting Python code is restructured text. So I don't even know if, if it's a good idea to use another language. So stick to Python standards, and Python says use restructured text, like using Java doc for Java or JS doc for JavaScript, etc. Yeah, I'm okay. So, and another thing is. Keep your doc string simple, so don't try the most advanced features and syntax within your documentation um, because it gets difficult to read and so on, and it makes you more language dependent. So what, in general, keep things simple, which includes doc string. Don't try to be too fancy with the way of documenting the things. Now. If we ask ourselves the other way around, okay, ASCII doc for Python, huh? Perhaps, probably not. What if we use restructured text for everything, for all kind of software documentation? And I think this would be technologically fine. You can use restructured text for everything. Coming back to ASCII doc, ASCII doc is a nicer language. It's easier to learn. It's more generic even for non-techies, but in the Python context, it's non-Pythonic, which I explained in the slide before. Now, restructured text would cover Python doc strings, but would not be compatible with Java doc or JS doc. On the other hand, it has a steeper learning curve. So restructured text is kind of nerdy and clumsy, and it's more aimed at text-savvy people. So then I was thinking, about compromise, what if you have tagged source code includes in ASCII doc, which means you have an external or several external ASCII doc documents. And what they do, you have tags in your source code and your ASCII doc document has a look at the source code and includes the part of the code and then displays them in this external document. This would be a nice solution. It would work similar across all programming languages. So when your software product or your company uses a lot of different pro programming languages, this might be perfectly fine. This might be a very good idea. It, it, you get a language independent way of documenting things. But on the other hand, you then introduce a distance between the source code and the actual documentation. And that's what I said at the beginning could be a disadvantage because then you could miss, when you change something on source code, you could miss the fact that there is some documentation relating to it. That's the disadvantage. There's no um, um, general solution. I s simply suggest these are fundamental decisions, so simply carefully discuss it with your colleagues. It's not an easy decision. It's not decided within five minutes. But I presented you the options. OK, I'm coming to an end. We are doing fine, perfectly. OK, three ingredients for successful software documentation. First of all, let me uh, um, re, I forgot the word, remind you of what I said at the beginning. You need a doc docs as code infrastructure. This could be in Python restructured text in combination with things. This could be ASCII doc in combination with Antora. That's the generator for, that's the Sphinx uh, way for ASCII doc. You could use Java doc, HTML, and so on. It doesn't matter too much, actually. Just don't use Markdown. Now, the second thing, you need few but responsible people for the software documentation. This might probably surprise you because you think, well, it's good if everyone documents, everybody has to document, everybody can document. Um, but there's a saying which says, too many cooks spoil the broth. Um, I've never seen that it works. So there are too many different quality, um, yes, different qualities. Um, 
there should only be few people who are very good at documenting and who want to document who do this job. You could call these people, these few people, technical writer, technical writers. You could call them doctator. And if you ever wondered how such a doctator looks like, like this. And number three, you need a documentation guide. For example, have a look at the GitLab, how they have a documentation style guide. It defines what language you use, if it's British English or American English, which, by the way, is an important decision. If you capitalize the section titles, etc., etc. So there are some things, the more you get into it, there are some things that need to be regulated. Last slide. Documenting can be learned, really. It can be learned like programming. Just be open-minded and read and, and hear about it. It all depends on a systematic approach. I'm always surprised that you have everything defined regarding software documentation, and you have the tests and the pipelines and the procedures. But when it comes to software documentation, so everything is defined for software development, but not for software development. Documentation, when you ask people how, what system do you have for documentation, they simply say, we write a little bit. That's, that's not systematic. And get external help if you want to avoid reinventing the wheels. There have been many things going on during the last five to 10 years. Don't reinvent the wheel. There are many cool things regarding software documentation. It's no longer writing stupid word documents. And specific next steps, read this article where I talk about the lightweight markup languages. It's in English and in German, so the blog post is in English, and then you have a link to the German PDF, but I guess no one speaks German here. Then take my software training program and my business card. So when you leave the room, please feel free to get my brochure and my business card, and feel free to follow me on LinkedIn in order to stay up to date about this topic and many more topics. And here is the link again. Thank you so much for your attention. It was a pleasure. OK, thanks, Christian. Uh, it was a great presentation. Uh, do you have time for some questions? OK, great. So the first one is uh, actually the last one I asked, but it's kind of interesting. Do you use LLMs for technical documentation generation professionally? And what's your way of working? So I don't use LLMs. Um, I just have one s saying regarding documentation using LLMs. Machine learning documentation is documentation of the obvious. We can put in a function and it tells us what to do. This is actually this is not interesting. So we as humans, and this is valuable information, we should write down things that are not so obvious. Why have we chosen this? Just think of the word why. That's the most important question. Why? Why have I chosen this approach? Why is it written like this? If you, and this is something uh, uh, machine learning cannot explain. OK, thank you. And another one, we might have time for another one. Uh, have you got some suggestions uh, regarding documentation of SQL queries, uh, which are often needed for data science projects? Uh, well, SQL code is also code. So write it down the way it is. SQL, it's like regular expressions. It's nice for those people who wrote it. I wrote it. I understand it. It just took me two hours, but now I understand it. Um, but the people who read it no longer understand it, especially, you know, regex, regular expressions, which, uh, and, you know, SQL, which um, just explain and write down what you did and think of others. Others need to read it again. You invested two hours for the SQL statement, and others need four hours to understand it. So please write down. You also have comments in, in SQL, so simply write down what you did. Okay, thank you, Christian. One more round of applause for Christian. Thank you.